And we're going to ask each of them to speak for seven to 10 minutes, and uh, then uh, we will open uh, the floor for questions and comments. So first up is David Beckman. If Senator Luger is the a preeminent senator on uh, agriculture issues, David is the preeminent person in Washington on uh, anti-hunger issues, having been the president of Bread for the World since 1991. Probably everyone in this room not only knows David, but certainly knows his reputation and the work that he's done to highlight the importance of hunger issues in this country and abroad. David. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here with all of you, and uh, this is really a fine report. I want to use my seven to ten minutes to talk about uh, farmers in Mozambique, the President of the United States, and us. Um, I just had a chance to go to Malawi and Mozambique, and I was able this time to go to a really remote area. Um, we flew in by, with a small plane, and then we took this big old wooden boat <laughs> across Lake Nyasset, and our first stop was a little settlement of 40, 40 households called Ntimbe which is about 100 miles from the nearest road. We were, we were way out in the boonies. And um, I, just visiting a number of families there, we stayed with a family, the man who uh, moved his family out of his thatched roof house so we had a place to sleep was named Pedro Compila. Uh, we met his family and other families there. I was, I was struck in a particularly urgent way there uh, by the vital importance of agriculture. In, in Timbe and the slightly larger settlements that we visited, there, uh, there are no shops, there are no government buildings, there are no concrete buildings. Basically what you got is this scatter of little houses, mud houses, um, and each household has a cassava field. They don't grow much except cassava there. Sometimes they have a few vegetables. But basically, it's the cassava field. Uh, and if, if that cassava field flourishes, the family's doing fine. Every, people are really, really fine. If that cassava field fails, there is nothing else. They're going to go hungry. You know, maybe they can beg from a relative if it's not, if, if it hits the whole village. Then the relative's cassava has also failed and they will go hungry. And everybody I met in this area of northern Mozambique, everybody has gone for long periods with little or no food. They know what it is to be hungry. If, if, they, if Pedro could get access to fertilizer, fertil, chemical fertilizer is <laughs> no way. If he could get access to a little chemical fertilizer, it would be transformative. Or just across the lake in Malawi, I saw uh, uh, some agricultural development work going on where people were learning slightly improved agricultural uh, practices. If people in Mtimbe would know how to do those things, they would be really well off. Now in Mtimbe, the main thing is they now have peace compared to, you know, 16 years of war. We didn't do anything to help on that. And also some people in Mtembe have cell phones. So, you know, when the sun goes down, there's no electricity, but you can see the tower off on, uh, in the distance. Really interesting. We didn't help much on that. Um, but then they also, all, almost all the kids in Mtembe are in school. And that was really triggered by uh, debt, debt relief and development assistance from the U.S. and the other industrialized countries. Even the AIDS orphans go to school. And then strikingly, in Ntimbe, I met three people who are living with HIV and AIDS who are getting antiretrovirals thanks to the U.S. taxpayer. So, but virtually nothing has happened to improve agriculture in northern Mozambique and it's partly because this report, uh, you know, the recommendations in this report haven't been acted on for 10 years. It was just very clear to me uh, in the life of Pedro Campila that this report would make a big difference. 
Uh, second, the uh, President of the United States. The, there, the two most important sentences in this report are on page 15 and page 27. Uh, on page 15 is the quote from President Obama in the inaugural address. We have never had a U.S. president who's talked about global poverty this way in an inaugural address. Um, to the people of poor nations, we pledge to work alongside you to make your farms flourish. And on page 27 is a just a week later, Secretary Clinton spoke to the high-level conference on food security. Uh, the President and I intend to focus new attention on food security so that developing nations can invest in food production and so forth. Uh, it is really important that uh, President Obama and Secretary Clinton uh, basically, they get, they agree, they tell us, they agree with the thrust of this report. And I think actually one of the most brilliant bits of this report is that year one is things that uh, the administration can do just with the appropriators. So to do year one, they don't need to wait for authorizing legislation. That's really smart because my sense is that, um, my sense is that the Obama administration, Secretary Clinton in particular, is really interested in food security, agriculture. I think they're going to, they, they, and they need things, they want things that they can do fast out of the box. Um, so I, I especially appreciate, I mean, what I, I think, you know, you know, you need to get to Secretary Clinton and make sure that she sees this because this gives her and the people around her a, a program of action that they could carry out in this area very quickly. Then the, the third point I want to make is about us. I think we need to do a better job of getting our act together. By us, all, presumably everybody in this room, individuals and organizations that are trying to influence U.S. policy on agriculture in poor countries, agriculture food security. And um, I am struck that this is the third major event in Washington this week on agriculture and food security. Now, the Chicago Council Group and the rest of us have done a good job, so there is a lot of alignment among the ver these three reports initiatives. Uh, it's not like they have complete conflicting ideas. There's, there's a considerable degree of alignment, which is, gives us a better chance of actually getting these things to happen. Um, but there are three separate things going on. You know, why in one week did we need three things? And then there are also other initiatives going on on related things, AIDS and malaria and child survival and education. You know, for Pedro Campila, he doesn't really care what sector it is. Um, and he certainly doesn't care what institutions behind it. In Congress this year, we're going to have, there are a number of different legislative initiatives and also a number of legislative processes where we need to get these things done. We need to be involved, somebody needs to be there involved in those legislative initiatives and processes. But as I look at it, there are, there are just a lot of them. There's some scattering of where the troops are going to be. So it just seems to me, we, there th my suggestion is I think three, three things in terms of getting getting a better alignment of all of these efforts so that we really get something done this year. You know, if you listen to President Obama's speech last night, the President and Congress have got a lot on their plate this year. And if we don't have our act together, if we're doing our various little hobby horses, we're not going to have our maximum impact. We need to somehow be aligned so that whatever attention we can get to hungry and poor people around the world, we, we can work together to get something done. I think one way to do that is we just need some additional conversation. I think uh, Kathy and Dan and their colleagues have already uh, gone out of their way to be in conversation with the uh, uh, roadmap to end hunger, the, the partnership to cut hunger and poverty in Africa. There's an agriculture development uh, campaign that's an, an appropriations campaign, Bread for the World. But we need to have, now that these reports are all out, we need to have additional conversations about moving forward, how are we going to get better alignment on hunger, poverty, and development? Um, 
Second, I think as the President and the, uh, Secretary Clinton come out, uh, as they decide and clarify, what are they really going to push for? That'll help us get our act together. When President Bush said he wanted to do the MCA and PEPFAR, that helped, you know, to have the President of the United States said, okay, this is what I want to get done, then a lot of groups came around those ideas, to, not just to do what he wanted, but to shape and support those ideas. The President sets the agenda. And we do have a president who's probably going to push for something very much like this. So I think uh, that'll help us get, to get, get our act together. And then my third point is I, I think, in my view, we need to uh, push this year to get broad reform of foreign assistance. So we've pushed for 20, 30 years on various sectoral specific things. Um, but we need, in my view, we need a strong uh, you know, what Dan was just saying about um, a way of triple hatting AID, MCA, PEPFAR, that would be a step in the direction of a strong, accountable uh, development agency focused on poverty reduction. Uh, I think it should be an Obama-esque agency that has a strong website, a strong outreach to civil society in our country and around the world. It should be participatory responsive to the priorities of local governments and local people. We really need to get that done. And um, we have a better chance this year to start on it than, we will, than we've had for decades. So as we do the more specific things, I think all of us need to push together to get that broad reform of foreign assistance. And if that happens, we'll get more money for agriculture. And some of these other things will get done as well. Thank you, David. Uh, IFPRI, I think all of those of you who have been in this, in this work will agree, is the world's, world's premier research center on food and agricultural policy. I know that certainly any of the uh, roles that I have had in the past in, on um, agriculture or food related issues, I have relied uh, on IFPRI and its research and the data available, as well as the leadership of the Director General who is Joachim von Braun and our next speaker. Welcome. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, I, I really uh, commend the uh, Chicago Council for uh, to this uh, excellent and timely report. Um, it um, uh, it's produced by uh, by leaders in the profession uh, who care and uh, who uh, have the trust of all of us. So uh, this is a great report, which uh, uh, really uh, now awaits implementation, transformation into action, and. Um, I will cast my remarks uh, in the context of uh, what happens if action is not taken uh, versus uh, uh, what action uh, will do uh, in terms of improving the, the issues of uh, food insecurity and, uh, and hunger. Um, the, um, the five recommendations have been mentioned and I will particularly focus on uh, the number two which Dan Glickman already mentioned, increased support for agricultural research in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, I think the report not only got the issues right, it also got the regions right, it got the businesses right, which is small farms, and it got the people right, um, uh, strong focus on, on women. Um, the food price crisis in 2008, um, which showed these spikes, um, has uh, two aspects to it, which um, the recommendations of this, this report, uh, uh, if implemented, will change. One is a, an increase in prices, and uh, secondly, the spike. And um, the, uh, the secular increase in prices over the last uh, uh, four years uh, had um, um, uh, started to undermine food security, especially of landless people, and the spike has irritated markets and has uh, undermined nutrition of uh, lots of vulnerable people. And the response to this uh, situation 
um, requires uh, the focus on productivity, but it also requires, and that's my first footnote to the report, stronger action on market integration. Um, the, um, the recommendations on free trade, open trade, um, uh, are very important uh, and uh, need to be underlined as well. That we are talking about a food and a security issue is underlined by the red line uh, in, this, uh, in this graph. Um, um, the three dotted lines are prices of rice, of uh, wheat, and of corn, and the solid red line is the frequency of riots. Uh, the price elasticity of riots <laughs> apparently is high. <laughs> um, and uh, um, people have had made their experience last year that they are listened to. Uh, unfortunately, many of these riots were violent. Uh, about one third of them were brutal, violent. They toppled governments, but they also led to people killed in the streets. Um, so um, uh, that's a security issue. It's probably that red line which brings us together here. Um, the alertness, the, the uh, attention. And unfortunately not that we have an increase in hunger from 800 million to a billion. But um, that red line will come back if these, um, uh, with, with a spike um, if the actions proposed um, are not followed. Further stress for agriculture and the poor comes from the financial crisis and the depression that is now just at the time when capital is needed, less capital going to rural areas, to the areas which David described in, in Mozambique. Um, the debt burden uh, uh, increases for farmers who have started to invest, employment and wages down, reduced remittances. Um, the actions needed for smallholder agriculture are so central in these three areas, all emphasized by the report, access to finance and inputs, investment in rural infrastructure, and agricultural productivity. Um, uh, Dan Glickman already mentioned the um, ABCD recommendations under research, so I do not come back to that. It's an absolutely central element of the recommendations of the report. Um, as Catherine Bertini underlined, research at IFBRI depicted in this slide um, uh, that uh, shows that um, um, the increase in agriculture research and development, not just the research but getting it out to farmers, is critical for poverty reduction. On a global scale, we need urgently that one about 1% productivity growth, and in South Asia and in Africa, the 2 to 3% productivity growth enhancement, which will not fall from heaven uh, unless the investment in, in R&D is forthcoming. Uh, we have uh, uh, a list of best bets um, of the examples which uh, Norman Borlaug has given, he was quoted earlier, uh, and, and beyond. So controlling wheat rust is in here, uh, revitalizing yield growth in the cereal systems of Asia. These are the best bets of the consultative group of the International Agricultural Research, uh, which um, I um, uh, want to highlight. It includes also things which must be done because of the current world food price crisis and the, uh, the poverty issues, such as scaling up biofortification, get the nutrients into the crops and thereby into the diets of people who don't have enough money to buy a balanced diet, who, uh, if we would tell them, eat a balanced diet, would have to feel that, like the French revolutionaries uh, being told, eat cake if you don't have bread. What happens if these investments are not forthcoming? This is a recession scenario, uh, which we have run with uh, models at IFPRI. And um, um, the, uh, the economic question is what happens to international prices uh, under the current recession? Will the decline in demand bring prices down or will the decline in access to capital bring investment down so much that productivity will go down and supply 
uh, will be slowed down and thereby come prices up? Answer, the second is a more powerful force in the medium run. The second, the shortage in capital bringing down productivity growth will supersede the slack in demand, and that is the red line of this graph, prices catching up, bringing us closer again to the risky price spike situation uh, which we had last year. Then it will be price spikes in a depression, uh, in a, um, a shortage of income situation, and this double blow to the poor will bring us back to the riot situation. All global business chain players need to be involved in implementing the proposals. Um, the world last year has been sort of rescued from a catastrophe and uh, had to put up with a crisis only um, um, because of generous uh, action and fast action by the World Bank, the European Union and the USA. But fundamentally, the big push for addressing the food crisis issue came from China and India. Uh, they moved fast, faster than um, most of the G8 nations. Um, lastly, what and how of the US co-leadership um, in this field uh, uh, of action? Government, private sector, foundations, and NGOs um, uh, together. Um, U.S. leadership in agricultural development with partnership um, is called for. As uh, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton uh, posted at the high-level meeting in Madrid, um, calling on others to co-lead um, with China, with India, Africa, Latin America, and the EU as partners engaging from the U.S. side in the new global partnership on agriculture and food security that was launched at that meeting in Madrid, and shape the G8 and G20 agendas on food security in 2009. There's certainly one area where the U.S. can claim sort of born leadership, and that is science and technology. Um, uh, being the biggest global player in R&D, Reconnecting that R&D to the poor people and hunger issue should be on top of the agenda, and I'm grateful that this report puts this there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim. Uh, our third panelist is Monty Jones, who is the 2004 World, Prize, World Food Prize laureate, having won that for his exceptional breakthrough by combining Asian and African rice genome to develop rice uniquely suited to poor African rice farmers. That was when he was with the West African Rice Development Association. He is now the Executive Secretary of the Forum for Agriculture Research in Africa, one of the new institutions uh, to which I referred earlier. There he oversees advocacy and coordination in support for regional research and development uh, directed towards alleviating poverty and improving food security in Africa. He's also a board member of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. Dr. Jones. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, actually, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be here today to give this brief presentation. Uh, I only got to know about this uh, about two hours ago, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and uh, I would concentrate my, my talk on what Africa is doing, you know, to embrace this kind of initiative. You know, and, and uh, of course, I would also like to commend the authors of this report. You know, it's really a very good report, and, and I think that Africa needs this kind of interventions. You know, um, we all know that agriculture is supposed to be the backbone for uh, economic growth in Africa. The majority of the African population are involved in agriculture, and it is the, the base for their food security and livelihood. You know, but of course, our agriculture have not done very well in the past uh, three to four decades because we see agricultural productivity declining or remain stagnant 
you know, during that period. Although, beginning of the 2000 era, we're beginning to see some kind of green light with agricultural productivity increasing, showing signs of taking an increase in trends, which is really very good. Uh, but what, what are we doing in Africa to address this situation? Our political leaders came together uh, in the early 2000 era and, and, and developed uh, NEPAD, the New Partnership for Africa's Development. And NEPAD, in turn, of course, recognizing the importance of agriculture, developed the CADEP, the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. And uh, this program recognizes uh, the, the, the vision for agricultural development and call on all nations to attain 6% agricultural production growth rate by the year 2015-2020. This is a daunting task because basically at 6%, we're saying that we must develop dynamic markets within the continent, between the continent and the international community. And we, our country should become net exporter of agricultural product and that there should be food availability and affordability. So this is really a very daunting task. And um, the, the, the CADEP framework uh, has got four pillars, and, and there's one pillar, pillar four, that relates to agricultural research, technology, dissemination, and adoption. Pillar one relates to land and water management. Pillar two uh, relates uh, to infrastructural development and market access, and pillar three to food, food security. These are key major areas, you know, uh, that requires intervention if we should increase agricultural activities. What are we doing in Pillar 4 in particular, you know, to, to uh, drive the agricultural research uh, program for Africa? What we did was to come up with a document that we call FAP, the Framework for African Agricultural Productivity, which gives the guidelines for the development of productivity program at national, sub-regional, and continental level you know, and uh, uh, it also outlined the processes that will guide or steer all institutions to go with their programs, you know, towards realizing the goals and objectives of uh, CADEP Pillar 4, of the entire CADEP process. You know, so basically what we've done in Africa was to come up with a continent-wide agenda, uh, a common agenda for agricultural development. and and. and and of course, those themes that I've mentioned are the key areas of, of intervention. But what is the status as far as agricultural research and development is concerned uh, uh, in Africa? One major problem that we do have is access to, to information you know, uh, across the board, whether it's from scientists or uh, extension workers, NGO group, but particularly the farmers, uh, the end users, the farmers, uh, 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 farmers and farmers organization. You know, although there's been a little bit of improvement recently uh, uh, in terms of developing platform that will help to create awareness of this, and, and we're trying to also develop infrastructure by making provision for institutions to have computers and things like that. But key area uh, of intervention here is how do we get that market information to the farmers? How do we get the farmers to know that the goods are going at that particular price, you know, so that they are not duped by the, by the middlemen? So this is a key area that we need intervention in. And also we've come up with credible technologies. Some of those technologies and Africa, the world food price, you know, and, and, and are doubling yields, but they're only doing well in isolated areas. So we do have islands of success there. And the question is, how do we disseminate? What structure, what mechanism do we put in place to disseminate these technologies so that it results to continent-wide impact? You know, and, and, and here we need further intervention. We're making progress, but we need intervention there. The Green Revolution bypass Africa. And we are saying that the gene revolution should not bypass Africa. So biotechnology and biotechnology initiatives is a must for Africa. Today, we're thinking of putting centers of excellence in this particular field in various areas. We've got only one in place, serving East and Central Africa. So again, uh, uh, we, we are getting into this field, but uh, we do need interventions here. And then for 50 years, we embraced the uh, linear system to technology generation, dissemination, and adoption, which researchers developing the technology is supposed to pass it on to extension. Extension is to pass it on to farmers. You know, it hasn't worked. Uh, although it created the islands of success that I mentioned earlier on. 
So we need to reform our institutions, uh, uh, agricultural institutions and, and, and services to get them to function effectively. And this calls for strengthening uh, education, strengthening research, strengthening extension, but most importantly, empowering the farmers, you know, so that um, uh, their voices will be heard in agricultural research and development. Another area relates to partnership. What kind of partnership do we develop within Africa itself amongst various entities and between Africa and the international community? And, and I think that we are making significant progress there because recently we created a, partner, a, a platform for African-European partnership in agricultural research and development. We want to see that kind of relationship with the, with the USA. You know, we used, we've had very long uh, 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 relationship with, with, with America, and, and I think that we could improve in, in, in this relationship. The civil society organizations, whether it's NGO group, whether it's farmers or farmers organization, the policy makers, all of these, are their voices heard in agricultural development and agricultural research? How do we get them to contribute significantly to the work, to our work? And, and again, so we have made some progress there. We've made some progress there because we now getting them organized and getting them to develop their own programs and, and, and advise on areas that they feel that they should intervene. And particularly, we are targeting the women farmers because the majority of our farmers are, are women and the youths, you know, so that their voices are heard in agricultural research and development. And to be able to do this, you have a common agenda. And there are interventions at various levels, from uh, continental to sub-regional and international level. You know, what kind of principles do you adopt? You know, because we're all trying to address that common agenda. The principles that we are adopting is the subsidiarity principle, where we devolve responsibilities and resources to the lowest level possible that will create or result to significant impact on the ground. And of course, I cannot end my talk without mentioning AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, that have come in now and working with NEPAD and all the other structures trying to get Africa to achieve the green revolution in three major areas, in seed systems, in uh, soil health improvement, and also in irrigation. You know, it, it's a big, 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 big plus to agricultural development program. And of course, we would like to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation you know, for uh, initiating this particular project, following consultation with the African partners. Uh, when I look at the recommendations that have been given, and that's why I say this is a wonderful document, you know, because it sort of echoes the priorities of my organization, the priorities that we outline in our, in our strategic plan and in our medium term and operational plan. So it is a very good working document for, for, for Africa, I must say that, uh, because you look at the issue of increasing support for agricultural education, capacity strengthening is a key area for us. It cut across all the pillars, the cadet pillars that I mentioned earlier on. Increasing support for agricultural research. Research must play its role to come up with new and credible, better technologies. You know, it's, it's always very important that research should be there to generate such technologies. Increasing support for rural uh, uh, agricultural infrastructure. Infrastructure is very, uh, development is very limited in Africa. Poor roads and whatnot results to very high transaction costs and reduce the competitiveness of our agricultural product. So it is a key area. I can go on and on and on, but I think that it's really a very good initiative, and I just want to say that Africa will embrace this uh, in intervention, and, and, and we look forward to strengthening our relationship with you, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Jones, now I turn the program over to Dan. Well, now we have the opportunity to hear from you um, either comments or questions or a constructive critique. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I would ask those of you who wish to comment or ask a question to any of the panelists or us, uh, or perhaps any of those who served on the Leaders Committee, um, uh, to uh, uh, Identify yourself, um, identify to whom you'd like a question responded to if it's, that's appropriate, and to try to keep your uh, inter intervention to one question if possible. So if we could begin and uh, 
there's there's mics back here, so I think Pedro, did you want to make a comment? Why don't you get a mic so you can? It's Pedro Sanchez. Thank you, Dan and, and Kathy. It's it's been a lot of fun doing this, and uh, especially working with uh, uh, with figures that are more on the political side than me on the scientific side. Where I think where we are right now is the tables have turned around, and are turning around. This is another nail in the coffin for the old ways of doing business, and now getting into the real practical things of how can we get rid of hunger and poverty in, in these two areas. Uh, I, I think where the point right now, at least in the world scene with the Madrid uh, meeting, that where the uh, European Union pledged one billion euros over three years for this sort of stuff, the government of Spain another one billion euros over three years. And uh, that's a lot of money. And we're waiting for the U.S. to weigh in at the right time. Uh, but the problem doesn't seem to be the pledges right now. The problem seems to be how does that money get to the farmer so the farmer can have access to fertilizers, good seed, irrigation equipment, agricultural extension, and have access to markets. And it's in the execution. And, and I saw two kinds of two kinds of tendencies at the Madrid meeting. One is, well, we're having this great meeting and then we'll go and have a summit and then we'll have another meeting and we'll have another meeting and another meeting. And that was very, very evident. And the other one was mainly from ministers of agriculture saying, we know what to do. We need additional resources. We're doing what we can with our resources. So I think this is where we are. This is exciting because it's beginning to put now the US in its, in its rightful place. Well, there's a lot of catching up to do. Thank you. Let's see. Though, why don't you just uh, let's just we can go the gentleman up here as long as you, we got it there. We'll we'll get as many of you as we can. Hi, I'm Sam Worthington. Interaction is the U.S. NGO community, and uh, we're a community that has about a hundred thousand staff on the ground around the world. And I was curious, what what roles can the international NGO community and local NGOs play within your recommendations? And how do we build uh, better cooperation uh, across uh, NGOs, universities, states, and, and global actors? And in our case, we're a community that's largely funded by the American people directly. Uh, so in essence, we are a large donor uh, at the table and, and have tremendous ground presence. Uh, but in many ways, I think that the conversation needs to increase uh, among different actors. And this is addressed to anyone who wants to address the question. Yes, uh, Interactions members as well as thousands of uh, NGOs from around the world are critical to any success of any development, not just agriculture. Uh, but in this case, I think there are several things. One is that there are there are some recommendations, like for instance, uh, local purchase for school feeding, that would be perfect for NGOs to pick up on and uh, and run with beyond what they've what they're already doing, uh, and um, because it needs to be seen throughout the developing world and certainly in the in all the regions in which we we talked about also i think the youth development that we refer to here the possibilities of of doing more to support young people in agriculture in africa and south asia and um, and you, we made some suggestions about the possibility of using uh, the models of 4-H and um, of future farmers of America here in this country, certainly NGOs would be well positioned to be able to doing work there too. And while NGOs themselves have do a fair amount of work in agriculture, they also have been victims of the non-interest by the U.S. government and other donor funders in agriculture. Uh, so I think the NGO community also could be very proactive in terms of uh, promoting this work um, in to the, this government and other governments so that there are more resources available. And, and then there are some of the sticky issues um, like monetization, which I know the NGO community has been involved in and has different views about. But one of these days we really need to have to, to get down to the very bottom of that and, and uh, make sure that the resources being spent are done so in the most effective means possible. And, there could be NGO leadership there too. David, want to comment? I do. I do want to comment. I think uh, my guess is that the U.S. Uh, U.S. NGOs have been investing 
more in poor country agriculture than, say, USAID for quite a while. And um, so I think Sam's point is right, that they are a, a significant actor in agriculture. And um, part of the reform I think we need in U.S. foreign assistance is uh, to turn, I mean, well, first we need a stronger AID, MCA, PEPFAR, but we also need it to be uh, a much more uh, publicly oriented agency. Um, you know, um, so this would be, one reason we need a strong agency is not just to speak for development within the councils of government, but to have a strong voice that's saying, talking to American people, because the American people are and want to be involved in reducing hunger, poverty, and disease around the world. So we need a spokesperson for, from, for the nation on those issues, and then also to strengthen the participation of all of society, the, the NGOs, the religious community, businesses, to help that our whole society make an effective contribution to the reduction of hunger, poverty, and disease in the world. So I, I think that's one, one way that, that um, these recommendations could maybe be tweaked to, to take fuller advantage of US NGOs. On the, on the, the other issue that Kath, Kathy just raised about uh, food aid, um, just yesterday, uh, Tony Hall has, has pulled together a broad coalition of NGOs, including all of the major groups that administer, charitable groups that administer U.S. food aid. And uh, remarkably, yesterday they uh, released their roadmap to end hunger, or for stronger U.S. leadership in ending hunger. And so this is Catholic Relief Services, Care, Save the Children, World Vision. The, these are many of these, a couple of these groups, a large part of their budget comes from food aid. But what they are now saying together is that over a period of several years, we should move to so that um, much more of our nutrition assistance to poor countries should be cash that can be used for local purchase, which would strengthen agriculture locally. It would also make the nutrition assistance more effective. And they're also saying together that the U.S. investment in agriculture should over a period of several years uh, reach reach the same level as our contributions to food aid. My guess is agriculture is now about one-tenth of what we put into food aid. So um, just right now, I think the, that part of the NGO community has made a major shift to sort of from a traditional kind of administer food aid position to a much more, a, a position that's very close to the recommendations of the Chicago Initiative. The gentleman, uh, right, the red tie, right here. Yes, sir. There's a yeah. You got me. I'm Riaz Nakshbandi from American University. If I understood it right, uh, one of the recommendations deal with the issue of restructuring U.S. aid and connecting it with uh, the Office of uh, Management and Budget. Could you please elaborate a little bit on this and the rationale for it? Uh, well, I, th I think one of our Paramount concerns is was has been the I characterize it as the diminished role of AID in the international development assistance uh, structure uh, that's been accelerating over the last couple of decades, and um, uh, we know that the three most powerful letters of the United States government are O M B, <laughs> and, and um, they make a lot of decisions in terms of. Uh, policy based on money, and we'll see it in the President's budget, which comes up tomorrow, I think. So we think that uh, uh, without necessarily moving every box around there is in government, that, that uh, USAID ought to have a direct relationship with OMB, so it will have some independence in the budget uh, setting um, business that we play all the time here. Let's see, this gentleman back there. My name is Carl Hausman from Bungie. I'm also a member of the International Policy Council on Food and Agricultural Trade. I'd like to make a comment in, in terms of policy. Your fifth recommendation was about policy issues in the U.S. which have a negative effect on trade. My feeling is we need to elevate the look of policy and say, 
what type of agricultural policy will sponsor the, in, the uh, self-resolution of these problems. I think the short-term need for NGOs and private aid is obviously there, but the long-term has to be a policy environment which is conducive to growing the right crops in the right places. I would contend that the U.S. agricultural policy is too American-centric and not thinking of what crops do we grow in the U.S., what are, where do we have a comparative advantage, of where should we be growing these crops? The same thing for Europe. Furthermore, I think in many of the developing countries, not enough attention is given to what agricultural policies there will sponsor a private sector response to addressing the long-term need, because long-term need can't be through NGOs and through uh, private or, or through governmental aid. So I would feel that the overall look uh, at, at agricultural policies, what do we need to address this, is really central to the long-term resolution. If we look at countries in South America that have come a long way in the last 20 years, I think they've done this more through internal policy and issues than they have through foreign aid or NGO support. And I think Africa, Asia requires the same look at their internal policies. But I would like to end by saying we should begin in the U.S. and Europe seeing what is the effect of our policies outside our borders uh, which I think is very significant. I don't know if that is a little bit more of a speech or a question, but maybe since uh, Secretary Glickman yeah. used to be in the USDA. I well, we have, we have uh, some uh, uh, former policymakers here as well. I mean, I think you raise a very good point. In, in some sense, you know, U.S. agriculture policy is, 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 is aged in a sense. It's going on for a very long time, since the 1930s, and it's been rather rigid. And it's, uh, in, it's putting this inelegantly, rather not very, res it's been very resistant to fundamental change. But there, there are reasons for that. And uh, one of the reasons is that our political system, which is uh, unique and which I think encourages uh, elected officials to look out for their local constituents, which is what a democracy is all about. So uh, in many cases, uh, uh, there's an old theory that political theory is nothing more than the rationalization of economic self-interest. Well, that feeds itself through our political system, and you know that's kind of the way it is. However, that doesn't mean that uh, intellectuals and people who are looking at fundamental policy can't try to change the system through the force of their brain power and their intellect. And uh, you know, um, uh, and and I, I can't speak for the rest of the world. I, I can say that I. I myself probably was one of those resistant people when I was a policymaker, in a sense. But, um, but I think there's more and more discussion of this. The Chicago Council itself, a couple of years ago, under Kathy's leadership and Marshall, came out with some you know, policy recommendations for much more fundamental change. And uh, all I can say is I wish the new Secretary of Agriculture a, a lot of good luck in this regard. <laughs> <you know? laughs> yes. Yeah. Good. Um, I, I would very much agree with uh, Karl Hausmann that um, um, the set of recommendations under number five uh, can be expanded. I think it's right that uh, uh, the group focused first on rewriting the foreign assistance bill and, and uh, getting aid uh, for agriculture up and um, not waiting for legislative process. But I think uh, maybe a, a second update of the Chicago Council uh, on these issues should include revisiting the Farm Bill and revisiting the Energy Bill, uh, which has uh, the stipulations which will continue to uh, disrupt uh, uh, through the biofuels policies, uh, grain markets. Uh, but those, I think, are long shots, and, uh, but they need to be on the agenda. I would like to go back to Pedro, the points you made about money getting to the farmers, you know, which I think it's, it's really very important, you know, because too often the support goes to research institutions, to ministries of agriculture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we tend to forget the farmers. And these are the people that are investing their time, even their own resources, to improve their knowledge, and when you consider subsistent farmers in Africa, you know, they, they, they're given quite a lot. 
you know, to improve their agriculture. And I think that the only time that such farmers, even if they are subsistence farmers, the only time that they can make significant contribution to economic growth of their country if, is when we increase their income. And if we provide these people with the means, with resources, they will tell you tomorrow how they will get out of poverty. I know the farmers, the African farmers, they are really very resourceful. The other issue related to NGOs, they are everywhere. The American NGOs are functioning in Africa. You know, you go, uh, uh, you go to any city, any capital city, you find probably up to about 30 agencies, including American NGOs, you know, that help to drive the, the agricultural uh, program, uh, rural development program uh, uh, in most cases. So we value this contribution, you know, that we get in from our NGO partners. Linking that to food aid, food aid is good, but food aid sometimes makes people lazy, you know, because they depend, they depend on, on, on the food. And I think that our aim should be to prevent people from getting into emergency food situations, you know, by, by knowing when to intervene to prevent it. You know, and I think that whatever intervention we make should help to strengthen rather than weaken the local or national coping mechanisms because they have some coping mechanisms that they have developed you know and 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 we don't just don't give them food and tomorrow they forget about their farms uh, this is basically what we're saying and any intervention should take in long term dimension long term dimension uh, uh, so that it helps to stop that problem and prevent it from reoccurring uh, uh, so these are some thoughts that I would like to share with the group. Thank you. Hi, I'm Charlotte Friedel from the National Intelligence Council, and I have um, kind of a question on something that hasn't been mentioned at all. Um, do you see any of the negative aspects coming out of what has been termed like the new land grab, neo-colonialization, offshore farming, all of this investment going into um, developing countries, sometimes in large amounts, for the purpose of taking that food and sending it back to a um, food deficit but rather wealthy country? Well, uh let me make a couple of comments. Uh, one is, uh, this is a, a, a third round effect um, of uh, the food price crisis because it's investment prompted by countries who feel no longer uh, secure uh, in their food supply. They want to secure their supply line and because they have lack of water and lack of arable land but they have capital and, so, uh, and they don't trust trade, um, because of last year's experience, and that's why you have this trend. So it's an aberration. Um, um, I think, however, um, uh, good can be made out of it. Developing country agriculture needs capital. And uh, I've been at a meeting in, in United Arab Emirates uh, a week, uh, two weeks ago, and um, uh, they very much think uh, uh, nowadays about... Um, uh, investment in small farm agriculture um, uh, in partnership rather than plantation type uh, agriculture. We need a code of conduct of prior information and prior consent of local people, herders and farmers, and um, adhering to sustainability uh, criteria in agriculture, then it can be win-win. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name's Jim Lyons. I'm with Oxfam America. And um, I just want to offer a comment and, uh, and then a question. The comment I can't help but address is, is this issue of, of, of U.S. foreign policy. Um, and the Secretary nicely danced around the, the question, which he had to deal with for many years. Um, this man used to work for me. Yes. <laughs> which is why I don't work for Dan anymore. Uh, but, but the point I want to make is the, the, the report brings focus to President Obama's comments at, um, in the inaugural and the focus on farms and helping them flourish. Well, last night the President spoke very directly to an issue that is raised in, in the Chicago Council report 
about subsidies and, and, and spoke specifically about eliminating direct payments for farmers who don't need them. Now, by my back-of-the-envelope calculation, this next year, those will amount to close to $9 billion. So it seems to me that if, in fact, an effort is made by OMB or, or the administration to move this forward, uh, simply taking a third of that, returning two-thirds to the Treasury to address the deficit, might fund a large part of what is recommended, in fact, through the Chicago Council report. My question really is, though, given the resistance that has occurred over the years, and given the fact that the foreign policy we operate under now was born of the, the last depression, is there a chance in our new depression to affect this change given uh, what the President said last night? What do you think the, the prospects are of actually moving this forward? And is this something that is worth reinvesting in on the part of the NGO community? Uh, it's certainly something that Sam's organizations and David and Oxfam and others worked hard to try to change in the, in, in the most recent Farm Bill, but unfortunately unsuccessfully. I, uh, my own view is that the, uh, that the economic uh, doldrums that we're, we are in will drive us, will drive President Obama and other leaders to conclude the Doha round. Uh, the, what we have to gain there is not just the fiscal savings of some money that's spent in a way that uh, doesn't do much public good, but also if we could conclude the Doha round along the lines of what's already been negotiated, uh, it would be a, it would be a, a very powerful way to get additional efficiencies in the global economy, and. I'm all, I, I favor the recovery package that was just approved, but there's only so much we can do to stimulate our economy by spending borrowed money. We have to take on efficiencies, and the President talked about efficiencies in health care and education and energy last night, but another area where we could get powerful efficiencies is through the liberalization of trade, starting with agriculture. So you get not only the efficiencies in the U.S. economy, but in the European economy, and by reducing uh, protectionism in many developing countries, you could get real, that's, that's real economic growth. You know, my guess is the stock market would go up 500 points just from agreeing on uh, Doha, because it would be a real boost to the global economy. I think the president will be driven to it because we need that. We need efficiencies, and this is one you can have by just the country that we were so close to an agreement. If they just get that agreement, um, it would be good for the U.S. economy. The Farm Bureau is in favor of liberalizing U.S. policies if the Europeans and Japanese do too, even for big farmers. This would be a better deal than trying to bequ bequeath a line of U.S. subsidies to their children, to be able to sell into Europe and Japan and the developing countries. So I think Doha is our best shot at uh, getting a liberalization of, of foreign policies. And I was delighted last night that the president took it on just from the fiscal point of view. But I, it just seems to me we're going to be driven to it. If we want to get out of this mess, we can't waste all this money. And the role of agriculture in climate, water, environmental issues, I think, is going to modify the history of how farm programs in this country and in the developed world have worked. That, that may be as much a factor as the traditional political factors. My name is Carla Stay. I'm a reporter with the War and Peace Digest and the Wayne Matson Report. And 10 years ago, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Stuart Eisenstadt, gave a press briefing at the Foreign, I believe it was Press Center, where he said that as a result of their experience dealing with the Asian financial crisis, they found that in the countries which had social safety nets, the crisis was least severe and there was the greatest social cohesion. And this gets us back to that red line that uh, Dr. Van Braun said brought us all together today. Um, as we were discussing upstairs with Catherine Bertini and with um, Mr. Bhutan, Marshall Bhutan, uh, the effort to create sustainable uh, agricultural self-sufficiency in the developing countries 
would almost seem in the end to require some form of institutionalization by the governments within those countries. I don't mean to take it to that extreme, but about the time that Secretary Eisenstadt spoke at the, the Foreign Press Center, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan came out with a call for a global new deal. Gordon Brown started speaking in those terms recently, and even Bill Clinton at the Clinton Global Initiative about a year or two ago agreed that all of the massive amounts of generous donations of aid that were coming from this country, such as the Gates Foundation and Warren, needed to be coordinated. And he said there was uh, an evolution possible into some form of a global New Deal whereby governments would have the capacity to ensure that the kinds of initiatives that you are uh, suggesting or encouraging would become a way of life. And this, of course, would require government regulation, but that's no longer um, a forbidden term. And Do you have a question? Yeah, the question is, how far um, will you be taking these initiatives? In other words, if there is local uh, indigenous control over agricultural, the agricultural uh, needs in the developing world, how will you ensure that this is sustained and what form would it take? we will see a very significant change, and that's why we're here today. Okay, um, it is now 2.30. Um, I wanna turn it over to Kathy to close. Uh, I do wanna thank the panelists here. I think this was extremely interesting for us. Um, and I wanna make one comment. Our, our goal here was to, kind of, was to thoughtfully study the issue and then present a strategic plan for how to deal with it over a period of years, uh, almost as if we were we were, give, we were trying to give the government a game plan. If you, if you did these things, if you did it sequentially, if you spent this kind of money, if you did it year by year doing d things, building a foundation here, this could have real impact. And it's not as if there aren't other possible solutions. We didn't monopolize the, try to monopolize the debate. There are, there are differences of opinion on some of the issues we talked here, but what this country needs, and we're now speaking to our country, is a game plan and then somebody has to lead the game plan. That game plan is gonna be led by the president and the White House and the, and the White House infrastructure and the, and the US Congress working cooperatively with the private sector and the NGOs, universities and other partners that we've talked about. But there's gotta be a game plan and what we've tried to do is, okay, here Mr. President, here White House is a, and others is a game plan for you. Take it and develop it and, and act on it. And I think that's what the goal of, of this particular thing is, and we hope that it's helpful in moving these issues along. Two, two final points. Uh, one is a thank you, and, and two is a quick summary. And the thank you is to Marshall Bhutan and the Chicago Council for his leadership and their leadership in making sure these issues uh, come to fore, um, uh, and uh, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for having funded this initiative, for the leaders group and the experts who have done so much to contribute and to those panelists who have joined us today. So first, join me in saying thank you, please. <laughs> and second is to revert to what uh, David Beckman said earlier. This is one piece of what's happening just this week on agriculture. But there, we have forgotten agriculture development for so long that now, finally, agriculture development is becoming high on the priority. If it's something the President of the United States is talking about, it is inaugural address, the Secretary of State is talking about something the Chicago Council has, has delved into and, and CSIS and, so, and USAID and, and the Peace Corps and BIFED and so many other organizations, uh, USDA, it is, its time has come, and you here today are part of its time having come, and now our job is to make sure that it moves and it moves fast on behalf of those hungry people around the world. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>